Hello and welcome back to Math and Tea, the show where we talk math and and drink tea. I'm your host, Professor Joseph Van Dyke. Before we get to the math part of the show this time, I thought I'd talk about the uh, tea part of the show because I don't do that terribly often. And people ask me, well, what kind of tea are you drinking? Well, at least this time, I'm having Twining's Earl Grey, kind of a basic standard Earl Grey tea. Nothing terribly superb about it, but nothing wrong with it either. It's my standard breakfast tea. In a previous episode, I talked about what I thought was one of the coolest things in all of mathematics that uh, most people never get a chance to see. That is, that there are multiple kinds and levels of infinity besides the one we talk about most of the time. And in this episode, I want to talk about what I think is the uh, second coolest thing in all of mathematics. And it's surprisingly closely related to the first. But first, let's do a quick review of what we talked about in the previous episode. We were talking about how do we compare the sizes of sets, even when those sets have an infinite number of elements in them. We showed that sets like the positive integers, or the set of all integers, or the set of all rationals, all have the same size. And we call the size of this infinity Aleph naught, because Hebrew, British, linguistic mashups are all the rage these days. We also considered the size of the set of all real numbers. Well, actually we only considered the size of the set of all real numbers between 0 and 1. We showed that this was a different, larger infinity than Aleph naught. We call this infinity Aleph 1. And we can proceed in this manner and find even larger sets with cardinalities that we label Aleph 2 and Aleph 3 and so on. However, this notation lends itself to a little quirk of thinking. The way these are written out, it looks like what we are saying is that the next infinity after Aleph naught is Aleph 1. But is there any reason to assume this? Maybe there is some weird Aleph one-half that's hiding between them, lurking in the depths between infinities. And this is the question of the famous continuum hypothesis. The continuum hypothesis asserts that there is no set which is larger in size than the set of integers, that is Aleph naught, but smaller in size than the set of reals, that is Aleph one. This is a hypothesis, not a theorem. It hasn't been proven. So the important question for a mathematician to ask would be, is the continuum hypothesis true, or is it false? Now here comes the weird and cool thing. We don't know whether the continuum hypothesis is true or false, but we do know that it is impossible to prove whether it is true or false in the standard realm of mathematics. All of this seems to fly right in the face of everything we think mathematics should stand for, that truth and provability should be one and the same. That is, if something is true, there should be a reason why it's true, and that reason why it's true should be that there's a proof that shows it's true. And if something is false, there should be a reason why it's false, and that reason should be that there's a proof, or rather a disproof in this case, that shows that it has to be false. And the continuum hypothesis just kind of runs roughshod over that. We've proved that we can't prove it. So is it true, or is it false? Okay, to talk a little bit more about this, we're going to need a little bit more technical language. We need to define what we mean by a formal system. We have talked before about how mathematical systems can be thought of as a series of assumptions, that is, axioms, a series of logical rules, and then everything that can be derived from those axioms by those logical rules. But we also need to have a language, a set of symbols, and a way of relating them into meaningful systems. Now here's some additional definitions. A formal system is said to be complete if every statement meaningful in the language can be proved or disproved from the axioms. That is, everything that makes sense is either provable or disprovable. A slightly less important notion for us is that of consistency, which we will just take to mean that things cannot be simultaneously true and false. Now consider the geometry of Euclid as a formal system. This has its classic five postulates and axioms, and was formulated in a way by Tarski to show that it was complete and consistent. However, this system has statements that can't be proved in it. For example, one plus one equals two, because as a formal system, it only knows how to manipulate points and lines and angles and those sorts of things. Even though one plus one equals two is a true statement with the common definitions of the words, there is no way for this system to prove it. 
This isn't a contradiction to completeness, though, because 1 plus 1 equals 2 can't even be expressed in the language of Euclidean geometry, which again only talks about things like points and lines and angles. While this system and several others are known to be complete, in general, completeness is a very hard thing to obtain, as shown by Gödel's famous first incompleteness theorem. It says, in essence, that if you have a consistent formal system that can express certain statements of elementary arithmetic, then you can't have completeness too. There must exist statements in the language that cannot be proved and cannot be disproved by the system. Now, Gödel's proof is a little ingenious. The classic liar's paradox is an attempt to determine the truthfulness of the statement, this statement is a lie. Gödel's incompleteness theorem forces a formal system to attempt to prove the statement, this statement is unprovable within the system. Gödel had to work hard to make sure that such a self-denying concept could even be expressed in the language of the system itself, hence the need for that certain amount of arithmetic. If you'd like a gentle introduction into Gödel's construction and how it works, I strongly recommend Gödel Escherbach, An Eternal Golden Braid by Douglas Hofstetter, and I Am a Strange Loop, also by Douglas Hofstetter. Now, the quirky thing about Gödel's trick is that because we can't prove the statement within the system, the statement is clearly true. This seems like we just proved the unprovable statement and formed a terrible, terrible paradox. But if we were to closely analyze what we have done here, it turns out our proof of the truthfulness of the statement was not done within the system that the statement was made in. We had to kind of jump outside the system. Now let's jump back to the continuum hypothesis. The standard formal system that most mathematicians work in is Zermelo-Frankel, ZF, or Zermelo-Frankel with the axiom of choice, ZFC. Now, Gödel himself showed that the continuum hypothesis cannot be disproved in ZF or ZFC. Paul Cohen, on the other hand, showed that the continuum hypothesis cannot be proved in ZF or ZFC. And there you have it. The continuum hypothesis is a completely reasonable statement within the language of ZF or ZFC. All it talks about is the sizes of sets. And yet, we have proved that we cannot prove the statement. Therefore, ZF or ZFC is not complete. Now, of course, we already knew that by Gödel's incompleteness theorem, but again, the incompleteness theorem relied on this crazy, you cannot prove me kind of statement, whereas the continuum hypothesis is a perfectly reasonable thing to talk about. Now, some of the consternation that surrounds the continuum hypothesis really comes down to a philosophical point. Is ZF or ZFC the right or natural way to do mathematics? Or is there a bigger system out there that's more closer to what we think of as natural, in which the continuum hypothesis is provable or disprovable? Well, maybe there is. But the problem is, Gödel's incompleteness theorem is always going to be there telling you you can't prove everything. Even if we're able to get the continuum hypothesis to a point where it can be proved, something else won't be. And then there's the whole question of whether or not truth is a meaningful concept in the absence of provability. But uh, this is starting to get really philosophical, and I can't do philosophy without tea, and, well, uh, I'm all out of tea. So that's all for now. Bye!